All right, welcome. My name is Mario Sanchez and I'm part of the Sumo Learn team here at Sumo Logic. Um, and today we're going to be talking about uh, becoming a power admin. So this level three certification. Um, we've, you've seen level two, level one already by, uh, in the last couple of days. So that's why you're, you're in this session. So I'm going to skip a lot of the how to use Sumo because this time we're going to be talking a lot more about how to, how to manage Sumo and how to set it up. Um, in particular, uh, we'll be talking about data collection strategy. So how does it, uh, we have many, many ways of setting up data collection. And we're going to find, uh, we're going to talk to you about uh, different ways to find the collection strategy that best fits your environment. Um, we'll talk a little bit about practice, uh, best practices around data collection. Um, one of the key things that we talk about is coming up with a good naming convention for your metadata. So we'll talk about metadata, what it is, how do you set it up, and how to uh, come up with a good naming convention that fits you. And then last but not least, uh, we'll, we'll talk about how do you create, uh, how do you share, and you can recommend some searches and dashboards. The last couple of days in Cert 1 and Cert 2, we talked about how to build dashboards and all that good stuff. Today, we're going to talk mostly around how, to, how can you share it, how can you recommend dashboards, how can you create templates to share with other users. And last but not least, we'll talk about some optimization tools. Maybe it's a little too early for all of you to start using these optimization tools, but I want to make you aware of what's available so that you can use it um, in future uh, in, in, in the in the coming months all right so with that said um, in the previous sessions I showed you how you use uh, the uh, sumo for monitoring and troubleshooting and the key there is that we're using a unified solution to be able to monitor both your metrics that help you identify the what what is going on but also your logs to identify the why why something is happening within my environment so if you haven't seen it by all means uh, watch the first few minutes of previous um, webinars and you'll uh, and you'll get a chance to see this demo itself um, from a 30,000 foot view this is what data flow looks like in sumo um, we bring the data into sumo through data collectors um, so sending data to sumo is, is done through collectors and sources and that is what we're going to be focusing on today mainly how to get that data data into sumo um, then we talk about how do we search and analyze that data and eventually how do we visualize that data and how to put it in monitors and alerts. So I'm not going to talk too much about number two and number three. We've covered them in previous webinars. Um, I'm going to be focusing mainly on data collection, number one um, in this chart. So let's talk a little bit about data collection strategy. The first things first is that we can bring data from just about anything in your environment, anything that spits out text, we can grab those and bring them in as logs. It could be in structured logs, it could be unstructured logs, it doesn't matter. You can even send us a book if you want to. We'll grab that book and we'll index it. Um, these uh, are some examples of, uh, of some of the sources that we normally bring in. So it starts with your network at the bottom, your virtual environments, all the way through your databases, your middleware, all the way up to your custom application code, right? If you're a development shop, um, you have your custom app code sitting on this layer of, uh, of, of, of things that we can get data from. And then on the right-hand side, you can see all the different infrastructure pieces that we can get data from, whether it is content delivery or some security systems um, or your IIS or your path environments. We can grab those logs and bring them into Sumo. Um, talk a little bit about designing your deployment. So, Getting data into Sumo is incredibly flexible. There's many, many, many ways of doing it. So coming up with a design that works for your organization is gonna be the key thing. Um, you've heard me briefly talk a little bit about installed collectors versus hosted collectors. If you look at that graphic on the right-hand side, um, the top part of that graphic is showing you examples of hosted collectors. That means cloud to cloud integration. We can take data from AWS, from the S3 bucket, and send it directly to Sumo. Or for example, we could do cloud to cloud log collection from Akamai WAF services or CDF services. Um, similarly, we could do APIs. Um, uh, we have, uh, sorry, we could do cloud to cloud log collection from uh, PaaS or SaaS platforms, for example, Google Apps and, and Office 365. Um, we even have some customers doing straight up HTTPS posts from their clients over to Sumo. The bottom side, the bottom part of this graphic is showing you installed collectors. So here's cases where, uh, let me start here in the top right hand side of the uh, or middle right hand side. Here's a case where we install a collector in each one of those machines, which those collectors send data over to Sumo Logic or a different method is you have an, a centralized 
um, a centralized infrastructure for collections of, of your logs, and we can take advantage of that. We can send through SSH or WMI that data over to that central collector and then on to Sumo. And I'll talk about the benefits of one versus the other in a little bit. Similarly, if you have network devices, firewalls, uh, routers, you can syslog that data over to, um, to the collector and then on to Sumo Logic. So uh, the first thing that I want to introduce was that concept of, uh, of installed collectors versus hosted collectors. Where does this show up? Um, if you haven't done so yet, let me show you in the UI, what does it look like when you're installing a collector? Um, so first of all, this is where you would go to get your collectors installed. You go under manage data and under collection. And in my training instance, you see that I have tons of collectors already in place. As a matter of, have, as a matter of fact, I have 11 pages worth of collectors. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can go about setting up your collectors. Um, you can click on add collector. And the first thing that it asks you is, are you doing an installed collector or are you doing a hosted collector, right? If it's a hosted collector, it's cloud to cloud and it's fairly straightforward. Nothing gets to get installed. If it is an installed collector, uh, once you click it, it'll ask you, okay, um, what are you installing this on? Is it a Linux box? Is it a Windows box? Is it a, um, a Mac a box? Or do you want the uh, binary package for that collector? So once you select this, it'll download it and it'll kick off the process for you to install that collector. The other alternative is to use the setup wizard. And the setup wizard does the exact same thing, except that it, ha it walks you through these steps. For example, it says, are you uploading some files, or are you, which, is, which might be for, for testing purposes, or are you setting, a, um, setting up a streaming data um, collector in here? And let's say that you want to set up streaming data collector, then it gives you some options in here. Great, are you bringing some Akamai Cloud Monitor data? Are you bringing some Apache data? Um, so you notice, depending on what you're trying to bring in here, um, maybe it's just some other random source. It says, is it a local file? Is it a syslog? Is it an HTTP source? So it just walks you through these steps and it decides on the back end whether it is an install collector or a hosted collector and it walks you through it. The setup wizard is really nice because it walks you through it. However, it doesn't necessarily have access to all the different advanced options. And what do I mean with advanced options? Well, let me exit, exit the setup wizard for just a second and pull up a um, pull up a collector. As a matter of fact, let me go look for an installed collector in here. So I'm just going to search the word um, install. Um, here's an install collector. All right, let's take a peek at this one and click on edit um, on the collector itself. So setting up the collector is actually incredibly easy. There's not a whole bunch, of, a whole bunch of stuff that you have to set up. You set up a name, perhaps a time zone. There are some advanced features in here, but um, it's you know pre pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go into some of these advanced features just yet. Um, however, for a collector you can have multiple sources, meaning the data that is coming in. So in this case, there is just one source for this particular collector. Let's take a peek how that was put together. If I click on that, I can see that this collector, this source has a particular name. Uh, it has a file path where it's grabbing that, that log, uh, the log file from. So it's saying that log file is found under users, such and such, downloads Apache Access Logs tutorial, so on and so forth. Um, a, a date where the collection should begin, the source host, the source category. So this, these are all the options that you would get if you're installing it through the setup wizard. However, there's a few other advanced options that you see down here, actually two advanced options as well as processing rules. When you're setting up a collector, you can, for example, blacklist some files from the list of files. If, if you had said here that you wanted to get any file that end it with the word any any csv files from this directory you could say but the but by the way i want to blacklist the ones that are star dot uh, or star um i don't know bak dot log or something like that right you can specify some of them uh, the ones you want to blacklist additionally sumo will do its best to identify a time format right um the default is yes let Sumo extract the timestamp and let it out of detect the format. But if you happen to be sending us logs that you're using very specific format for that, well, then you can specify your own format. In here, you can even 
uh, drop a, a, a timestamp locator and test it to see if it actually works. Right? So um, the other thing is uh, Sumo will normally look at the collector's uh, time zone and use that as a default, but you can change it. You can say ignore that time, uh, uh, ignore the time zone even on the log, log file and instead use this time zone over here as well. So there's a couple of things here that you can change. You can change the encoding and so on. And the other key thing that you can change is Sumo will automatically try to detect messages that span multiple lines. But if you know that your message do not span multiple lines, you can uncheck that. Or if you know that, that we, you do span multiple lines, however, uh, Sumo cannot figure out the boundaries of your message because they might be custom messages, then you can specify your own boundaries by going in here as well and setting up any regex that you want to specify the boundary of the message. And last but not least, you also have the ability to set up a couple of processing rules. So let me show you the example. There's four different rules that you can set up. You can set up rules to, um, actually three or five. You can set up rules to exclude messages that match a certain filter. Uh, this filter is in regex format that you would have specified. You can set it to include only messages that match. You can set it to hash messages that match the filtering. You can set it to mask filter messages. And you also can set it to forward messages on to some other environment. Um, for example, I can send it to, uh, I, I would have to set up um, my, uh, my forwarding destination, but I can uh, then have the messages be forwarded on to, like, say, an S3 bucket, for example. So there you go. I've shown you uh, kind of how to set up a collector uh, or a source and then some of the advanced options in here. If you actually set it up through, um, through the wizard, uh, let me um, just exit out this. If you set it up through the wizard, it's not necessarily going to give you those advanced options, but you can always come back, edit it, and, and set up those advanced options. Okay, so that's the that's the trick between installing a collector versus using hosted collectors. Let's talk a little bit around about best practice. Setting them up is incredibly easy, as you saw me uh, walk you through it. But let's talk a little bit about the different options. So um, I mentioned hosted collectors versus installed collectors. If you are doing cloud-to-cloud -cloud integration, then you would use a hosted collector. There's some pros and some cons about that. I'll talk a little bit uh, about them in a little bit. If you are setting up installed collectors, you have two options. One is you already have a centralized data collection um, uh, infrastructure, and you can take advantage of that. So you set up a collector in a centralized location, and you have your systems send that data to that collector, whether it's syslog or WMI or SSH. You send that data to that collector and onto SumoLogic. The alternative is you set up a collector in each one of your hosts, in each one of your servers, and then send that data over to Sumo. So two different types, the local data collection or centralized data collection. Let's look at some examples or, or let's look at some content uh, about that. Uh, before I do though, um, if you are setting up an installed collector, and by the way, all this is in, in our documentation, and this link in here sends you uh, to the installed collector requirements. But just to make you aware, if you are uh, using installed collectors, you should consider having an installed collector on its own dedicated machine. If you're running, if you're gonna be very running a high bandwidth network with a lot of very, very high logging level, right? Um, additionally, you might consider having a dedicated machine if you want a central collection point that is going to have uh, many, many sources as well. Uh, additionally, you could consider having more than one collector um, installed. So normally one collector suffices, but you could consider having more than one if any of the following conditions uh, comes up. So for example, the, oops, sorry about that. Um, the number of files coming into one collector is going to exceed 500. Uh, if your hardware has memory or CPU limitations, if you expand, expect that your logging traffic, your total logging traffic is going to be more than 15,000 15, events per second, then you might consider having more than one installed collector so that you can share the load. Um, also, if your network clusters are in different geographical regions, you might consider this as well. All right, again, all these requirements are in, uh, in our documentation, but I just kind of wanted to put them out there in case you guys had a, any questions around it. So let's talk about these three different options that I talked about here. Let's talk about pros and cons on them. So 
let's talk about local data collection first. So this is the case where you have a Sumo Logic collector installed on all target hosts. So each target host has its own collector and um, it's sending data directly to, to, to Sumo, right? So what are the, some examples of source types for this? Well, your local files, um, your Windows events, your Docker, your syslog, and any scripts that is out there. For example, you have a script that is running uh, to get data out of a database and bringing that data and sending it over to Sumo. Um, so what are the benefits of having local data collection? So the first one and obvious one is that you don't need additional hardware. Um, you are installing the collector on the same servers that you already have, right? The other positive part of it is that you can easily set up your automation. So you can use a chef or a puppet or some sort of scripting so that a collector can be uh, installed when you're spinning up a new, a, a new instance. Now, there's two, uh, two key things that are, that, that, that are drawbacks for having a local data collection. The first one is that you obviously are gonna need outbound internet access from those machines. If you cannot have outbound internet access, then this option is not the right one for your environment. And the second one is that obviously there's gonna be some sort of resource usage on that target host. So clearly you have a collector installed and you're gonna need some resources for that collector as well. Okay, some of the typical scenarios uh, that we see is customers that have a large amount of servers, usually very similar servers um, that are using orchestration, some sort of automation, um, and it's mostly OS logs that they're getting from, uh, OS and application logs that they're getting from those, uh, from those servers. So um, again, we see that anybody with a large amount of similar servers, so you have a farm of servers, um, they would more often than not go with this lo local data collection um, situation in here. All right, the second one is centralized data collection. So in this case, you have a Sumo Logic collector set up in a dedicated machine, and all other machines are sending data over to this collector, whether it is through WMI or SSH, um, or if it's syslog as well, you can be sending data over to Sumo. Um, what are the different source types that you find here? Um, syslog, obviously, operating systems, middleware, uh, any custom apps that you have out there, window events, so you can do remote window events, and of course, any scripting that you have as well. The benefits and drawbacks. The biggest benefit is your servers do not need any outbound internet access. Of course, the um, the server that does have the collector installed will need access so they can reach out to Sumo, but your actual host, your targets, your hosts uh, that have a, where, you, where you're trying to get the data from, they, they do not need any outbound internet access. Um, one of the other things I wanna point out is that we do not suggest that you go and build a, a centralized login infrastructure. What we suggest is that if you have one already in place, by all means, leverage that existing infrastructure. The reason for that is because managing an existing, uh, managing a, a centralized login infrastructure is, is, is a lot of work. You need dedicated hardware, you need dedicated resources, you have to, there's complexity to it, right? So if you already have an, uh, a centralized login infrastructure, by all means, leverage it with, uh, with this centralized data collection. Uh, the drawbacks of having centralized data collection is that it's hard to scale. Um, you obviously need dedicated hardware so you can put those collectors on it. And I, as I was mentioning before, it does add complexity. You now need someone to keep an eye on syslog rules. You have to have some sort of failover and whatnot. Um, typical scenarios of customers using this is uh, those that have mostly Windows environments or some sort of existing login infrastructure, let's say a log stash of sorts. Um, we see this a lot on on-prem data centers as well. The last one is cloud-to-cloud -cloud data collection, and this is where uh, data is collected via Sumo Logic cloud integrations. So the source types include S3 buckets, uh, anything that, gets, that can be written to an S3 bucket, uh, HTTP posts, so you could do Lambda scripts, Akamai one login, uh, basically anything that can do an HTTPS post um, to, to Sumo. And then we have a few APIs that we've developed as well for Google and Office 365. Benefits, great benefits, no software to be installed. This is cloud to cloud integration. With S3, we've seen some latency issues. This is something on the on AWS side. 
Um, we've, we've, we've worked with them to improve this, but there are still some latencies there that we have to be aware of. And then the other drawback that is very, uh, that is worth mentioning is that, um, if you have a cloud to cloud integration, there is just no easy way to recover. If, if there's a, if there's a break in the network, for example, connectivity, uh, a break in the connectivity of the network, um, there is no easy way to recover. Sumo doesn't know what had already been sent, what it received, what, what it didn't receive that was in transit. So you would need to implement on your side some sort of caching um, if you're doing HTTPS post over to Sumo with a cloud to cloud integration. And then typical scenarios are people that have cloud infrastructure. And uh, to be honest, of all these three that I have talked about, we don't see any customer that has just one of them. What we see is a mix of all three. So some customers are migrating to the cloud, and in those cases, they have cloud-to-cloud -cloud integration for those. Um, but we have customers that um, have some on-prem stuff, so they might have um, one of the other two options that I was talking about. So there is no right or wrong answer for this. To be honest, it's going to be a mix of, uh, of these three, depending on your infrastructure. Right. Okay. Any questions so far from what we've seen? If I see uh, no questions, I'm assuming everything's good and I'll, I'll move on. Let's talk a little bit about the metadata. So one of the things that you can set up, if you remember as I was going in here, let's, let's choose something a little more interesting. Um, so well, we'll, we'll grab these ones. So if you notice, one of the things that you set up when you edit your, when you set up your sources is you can set up a source host, you can set the name of the source itself, the name of the collector, you can set up a source category. Um, as well as you're bringing that data into Sumo. Um, if you look here, I'm going to look at some hosted, some hosted um, collectors. Let's let's look for AWS stuff. This might be kind of interesting. There we go. So look at this uh, collector here, or or this one. Um, this collector is bringing in EBS data from CloudWatch, EC2, RDS. Here's another one bringing CloudFront, CloudTrail, AWS Config, ELB. All these are bringing data. Um, we have a source category here, which is one of the fields that you set up for them. And if you notice, we've chosen a very particular uh, naming convention, Labs AWS CloudFront, Labs AWS CloudTrail, Labs AWS Config. Why did we choose something like that? If I may, let me just run a quick query here for, uh, for CloudTrail. The reason we do that is because choosing a naming convention that works across your data will allow you to do things like this. For example, here, I'm going to be searching not just my CloudTrail, but my CloudFront and my EZ2 and anything else that has uh, that starts in this particular way. Or let's say that I, um, that I wanted to look across not just my lab data, but my production data as well. I could do stuff like that. So coming up with a naming convention that is meaningful um, to your data is going to be very, very key. So let's talk a little bit about that with some examples. Um, as you saw, Every single message that comes into Sumo gets tagged with the name of the collector, the source, the source host, the source name. But in particular, I want to talk about source category because it could be anything that you want. This is the main metadata tag that we suggest you use. So here are some examples. What we recommend is that you do something like component one slash component two slash component three. And where component one is the least descriptive and then component three or or so on is the most descriptive so here are some examples i could have prod my app one apache access prod my app one apache error right so it's going it's using the environment first in this particular case or prod my app one cloud trail notice that you do not have to have the same number of steps it could, this one ha only has three components whereas these have four um, in parallel to these prod my app one, I could have prod my app two, Nginx access, prod my app two, Tomcat Catalina out, prod my app two, my SQL slow queries, and so on. This would allow me to do things like search for prod star my SQL slow queries, and it would allow me to look for all my slow, square, slow queries in my SQL for both my app one and my app two, right? Here on the right-hand side, we have the same ones, but in this case, we're doing it for dev. So dev my app one Apache access, or down here, dev my app two, my SQL slow queries. So 
Um, what I'm showing you is some examples of how you can start breaking up your source category. There is a, a good document here about good source category, bad source category. I would encourage you to have a look at it um, only because um, when you start seeing some good, some bad source categories, you realize, oh yeah, I can see why I don't want to do that. Right? Um, here's the reason why you want to come up with a good uh, source category. The first one is because it's going to make your, sim your searches a lot simpler. Uh, your scope of your search can now say prod my app one slash Apache, and that's going to look for both Apache access and Apache error logs from all your production environments. Or you can say star my app one Apache star, and it's going to look for all your Apache logs for all your environments, right? So for one, it makes the, the searching a lot easier. The second reason for this, it's because uh, down the road, in a little bit, I'm going to be talking about partitions, but essentially what partitions are, are indexes to store your data. So uh, instead of scanning all your data, what you can do is you can break your data into partitions, and then Sumo, when it's searching for your data, it only scans the, particular, the, the, the needed partitions. So guess what? You use source category to define those partitions. So in this case, I would have a partition that stores all my app one data, and I would have a second partition that stores all my app two data. That way, if I search for prod my app one Apache access, it only needs to look at 50% of my data. It doesn't have to scan all 100% of my data as well, right? Um, and then the third reason why you want to have a good uh, good source category is because you can use those source categories to um, to define your role-based access control. If you want to have a user that only has access to my app one data, you can do so by specifying here. Or imagine you could have a user that only has access to dev data, um, and you can specify it in here as well. All right, so with that said, here's some other examples. So common components that we see at customers uh, use, or you know, any combinations of this is they, they'll use the environment, perhaps the application name, maybe even like the region, like AWS region or, or some data center itself, uh, maybe even the business unit, if you're gonna have some different business units using the data for different reasons, right? Um, you, what you want to do is you want to put the highest level components uh, to be grouping the data how it's most often searched. So here are two examples, this is four at the top versus this four at the bottom. In this case, I do environment first, right? Prod dev, prod dev, web Apache access, or if I'm going to be searching across those, but I want to have web first, I could say uh, I could put the environment at the end. So it really depends on how you're going to be searching and how you're going to be looking at that data. You can, uh, you can have your components in, in the different order as needed. Um, so far, I've talked a little bit, I've talked about met, uh, uh, logs, but let me talk a little bit about metrics. So clearly, we can bring metrics into Sumo as well. If you're bringing up your host metrics, it's a piece of cake. You literally, as a matter of fact, I think I was showing you earlier, um, if I go back here to collection, here was, um, let's see, I thought I'd seen one that I, that I just pointed to you. Oh, yeah, here, this, this one here, right? So here is... Um, here's a here's a source for the metrics themselves. Uh, when you set it up, you literally just specify a name, you specify a source category, so we know how to identify those metrics. You specify a scan interval, and then you tell it which metrics you want. Do you want your CPU metrics? Do you want all of them or not? Do you want your memory metrics? Do you want your TCP metrics, your disk, your network? By default, Sumo turns these two on, and it'll bring all those, but you can turn on as many as you need, you, whatever you need to bring into Sumo, um, and just pick and choose what is it that you're going to be pulling in, and click on Save, and Sumo will start taking in all those metrics, uh, all those host metrics into um, into Sumo. The other uh, metrics that we can bring is eight, our AWS metrics. So AWS sends all its metrics to CloudWatch. Well, guess what? We can go into CloudWatch and grab those and bring them into Sumo. And the third one is Graphite uh, formatted metrics. So anything that is Graphite compatible, like CollectD, StatsD, and DropWizard, we can easily bring that data into Sumo. 
So here's a, a simple graphic to show you. If you already have an installed collector in your host, so this is my host, which has custom code. It's got my OS and container and all that good stuff. I can easily set up a hosted co a collector to pull in those host metrics over to Sumo. Um, if you have um, graphite compatible metrics, say through a metrics library or through a collect D or a stats D, yep, we can bring that straight into that collector and then onto Sumo. Stats D is a little bit different in that Stats D actually requires a Stats D server. So in that case, we would have to put the collector after the Stats D server. So Stats D sends it to the server, it does some aggregation, some filtering, and then onto the collector onto Sumo. And uh, last but not least, I would mention for CloudWatch, um, we use a cloud to cloud collector to grab those metrics from CloudWatch over onto Sumo Logic as well. Any, any questions from a collector perspective, from collection? No? Okay. Uh, I'm going to assume that most of you probably have set up already a collector and, and, uh, and this was a little bit of a review. Let's talk a little about a couple of advanced topics here. Uh, one of this, this next one is one of my favorite ones. So the fact that you're on this lab means that you're most likely an administrator and you have the ability to get data into Sumo. Um, and then later on, you're going to get a lot of users who's gonna, who are going to start using the application, right? Well, one of the best things that you can do as an administrator is you can start sharing some of the content that you create. A lot of the users are going to log on and not be necessarily know exactly how to begin. So uh, sharing content with them is going to be one of the best things that you can do. There's two ways that you can do it. Actually, three. I'll talk about the third one in a second. The first one is you can take any content that exists out there and you can share that content. You can either grant view access or edit access or you can even grant manage access. What's the difference? View, as you can imagine, they get to see it. Edit, that means that they can make changes to the dashboards or the queries. Manage means that they can delete it, they can move it as well. So you just want to make sure that you're giving them the right access so that you don't have your, your stuff deleted by accident. Let me show you how to do that. I'm going to switch here to the UI. Close some of this stuff here for a second. Uh, hold on, where's my mouse? There it is. Okay. So uh, let's say that I have uh, built a couple of things in here. I'm just going to my own personal folder. And in that folder, I have a couple of things. As a matter of fact, here's one called brand new dashboard. Um, I think I might have shared this already, but that's okay. Let's, I'm, I'm just going to show you how this is, is put together. So I can grab a dashboard that already exists. And um, if you notice in here, this, this, is, this is the dashboard itself. I have some sharing settings from here. Or I could have also gone to, uh, oops, let me go to that same folder. From here, I could have gone to the share folder in here. Uh, they both open the same dialog. Essentially, from here, I have three options. Let me just show you here. I have the ability to specify more people that I want to share with. I can see who has access to this dashboard already, and I even have a shareable URL. Let me talk about those three. First, let's start with a simple one. I can see who has access. So I have access to manage it. I built it, right? So I'm managing it. I've given my entire organization access to view it. You notice here I can do view, edit, or manage. So my entire organization has access to view it. And there is someone called Caleb, who's my co um, developer, and I've given him access to edit this dashboard as well. So both uh, myself and Caleb, we can do some editing to the dashboard and the organization can actually view it. So that's how you go about seeing who has access to this kind of stuff, all right? Let me show you some advanced options from this. Um, I, I, I'm just toggling this little button here, advanced options and had, had, hide advanced options. Advanced options means that for my entire organization, I am giving them view access, and I can decide if I want them, these guys, the entire organization, to also grant view access to other people, or no, they cannot grant any additional access. Um, myself, I, it's me, so I, there's nothing I can do there, but with Caleb, I can say, all right, Caleb has access to edit this dashboard, but can I also allow him to grant view access to other people? Can I, or, or not at all? So in this case, 
he can edit them, but he cannot grant any access. Or actually, I want him to be able to grant view access to other people, or I want him to be able to grant view and edit access to other people. So you start seeing how it, get very, it gets very granular um, in here. I'm going to add one more. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to go in here and say that, um, I'm going to pick on Stacy. I'm going to say that Stacy has the ability to manage this dashboard in here, right? So I'm gonna save, uh, share and save these changes. Let me go back and show you what happens now. I'm gonna go and share, and let's see who has access. So the usual suspects are there, and also Stacy is in there. So look at Stacy. In her case, because she has manage access, she has the ability to, oh, actually, I can say she cannot grant any access, or she can grant view access, she can grant edit and view access, and she can grant manage edit and view access. So you start seeing how it's very granular in terms of who can, uh, who can do what within Sumo. I'm gonna take Stacy out so she doesn't get uh, too much info in there. All right, uh, so you saw that you have the ability to, um, to grant more access to people. You can share that kind of stuff. The last thing I wanted to show you is this shareable URL. So for anybody who already has access to Sumo, you can send them this link to, to that. Uh, for anybody on this list, in this case, my entire organization, I can share them this link and they should be able to click on the link and go straight to that dashboard. But I could do additional things. I can share it with the filters that I have applied. I can share it with a time range that I specify as well. And I can even make my dashboard accessible outside of the organization. So if I wanted to share this dashboard with the world, I would choose world. I would say anybody who, ha who can get a hold of this link now gets access to this dashboard. That's a little bit dangerous, right? Because we don't wanna share this with just about anyone. So one of the things that you can do is you can say, hold on, I'm actually gonna restrict this a little bit. I'm gonna choose the white list, which means that only those people in this white list are going to be able, only this, those IP addresses in this white list are going to be able to access this dashboard with this link. So you start seeing how we have a lot of granularity in terms of how you can share these dashboards as well. Uh, by the way, for, in order for you to do that, you, uh, you have to go to uh, the white list and add the IP addresses. Here's the, uh, here is the documentation on how to do that. It's fairly straightforward on how to go about doing that. Okay, uh, questions on how to share content with, uh, within Sumo? Uh, let me go here, I wanted to go here. All right, pretty straightforward. The other way that you can share content in Sumo, oh, actually, uh, before I go there, so I showed you the example of how you can share a, uh, um, a dashboard. Obviously, you can do the same with an entire folder. So if I have an app and I wanna share the entire Thread Intelligence app, for example, I can easily go in here, click on share, and in this case, I'm sharing the, uh, the AWS folder and everything that is underneath. So remember, if, you, if I put another dashboard into that folder, it's gonna inherit the properties of that folder. So if I've shared a folder, I'm sharing everything underneath that folder, all right? Okay, so the other thing that you can do is, you can view, because you're an administrator, you can go into the content administrator and you can recommend content so that you can call attention to that content. So let me show you that. That's incredibly useful, especially if you have brand new users. So notice, I'm gonna go in here and, um, and go under, where's my mouse again? This is acting up, here we go. I'm gonna go, instead of viewing it as me, I'm gonna view it as a content administrator. And I can do that because I'm an administrator. So now I can see the content from every user, but I can also see any content that I have decided to recommend. So I have a couple of folders here of things that I, can, uh, that I recommend to my people. Uh, I have a get started folder and I have some security searches. So if I, if I wanna recommend this to anyone, uh, if I wanna recommend a dashboard to anyone, I can put it in this admin recommended area. So for example, let's say that, um, let's say that David Duke here, actually his folder is empty, so let me choose someone else. Let's say that uh, Frank Reno has created a great, um, a great um, query, and I wanna share that query with someone, right? So here's this backshift demo query, for example. Well, let's use this geo demo query, 
And I want to share this query with everybody um, in my organization because it's something very meaningful. So what I can do is I can actually grab this query and I can move it. I can move this query to the admin recommended. I can put it in different folders, or I can just put it in here in the admin recommended and move that query in there. What happens with that is that now users can get to see that query. So if I go back to, um, to just my own folder in here, oops, I, I need to get out of this to just show you how it looks like a normal person, a mere mortal. <laughs> you um, you see that I have, um, you see that here right now, I have my personal folder, where is the stuff that I own, but I also have a, uh, a library of everything, including admin recommended stuff. Now, the reason I don't see that other one in here is because I didn't share it. I put it in that rec admin recommended folder, but I didn't say who I wanted to share it with. So let me just go back and do that. I'm going to go back to content administrator, go back to admin recommended and say, here is this one. Um, right now, it's just, uh, it's just something that I can do. I want to share it. And I want to share it only with those people who have a trainee role for example, and they're going to have the ability to, um, they're going to have the ability to view uh, this kind of stuff, right? So now I can share it. What I just did is I gave the ability for anybody who has a trainee, uh, ooh, which is not me. So let me just go change that and say share with anybody who's a trainee, but also share it with anybody who's an administrator, right? Now. Let's do the entire organization. Why not? Entire organization has view abilities to it. Okay, so now I've shared it with everybody. Let me switch back and be an everybody myself, be a someone, not, no longer an administrator. What you're gonna see is that in the admin recommended, I have the get started, I have the security searches, and I have the geo demo. So this is just a great way for you as an administrator to be able to put stuff out there for people to, uh, to be, for, for folks to be able to see and use in your organization. Um, there's the query itself. Um, I don't know why this came out. There's a query itself, and I can now run that query as needed. All right? Great. Um, one last thing I want to show you about sharing and dashboards and searches and all that good stuff. Uh, this is uh, something that we released only a couple of weeks ago, but it's incredibly helpful. And what it is is the ability to create templates. Let me show you an example. Let me just go open a query here. Um, let's do, why not, this one, GeoLookup. All right, so this query, um, hmm, this GeoLookup is not that interesting. Let's see, well, that's all right. This will do the trick. Let's say that I have this query here that allows me to pull latitude and longitude. Actually, I'm going to improve that query. I'm going to go to my um, GeoLookup. I'm, I'm just going to go to the, um, the documentation and find out what other fields I can pull, pull up. Uh, so here's a good example. Great, latitude, longitude. I'm going to pull all these fields. Um, postal code. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to improve that query and say, listen, I want to see more. I want to get latitude and longitude in all these fields as well. Um, and then I'm going to count by all those fields. So if you look at this query now, it gives me all this detail. And as you probably saw before, I can map this query and all that good stuff, right? So let's say that I want to make this query available to my different regions. I have a whole bunch of different regions in my, uh, in my organization or different countries, and I want them to be able to use this query to search stuff, right? But my users are not all that technical, so I want to make it pretty simple for them. I don't want them to have to look at, at this syntax. So what I can do is, let me go back to my query and see what countries we have here. So Canada, France, all right, let's say, I'm just gonna pick on, well, let's pick on US for now. I can easily go here and say, where uh, country code, if I could spell it correctly, country code, geez, code, equals um, US. Right. So what that's going to do is it's only going to show me results for U.S., as you would expect. So if I look at the map now, it should show me just the U.S. because that's the result I'm looking for. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, now, it, this would force our users to come in here and tweak this and change it to FR, and you get the point. Like, they would have to go in here and tweak it. One of the things that we could do, 
is we could create a template query, meaning that I'm gonna hide all this stuff and I'm just gonna ask for a parameter, in this case, this parameter that is in here. So the way to do it is you can highlight what you want to make a parameter, and you notice that up here it says, do you wanna create a parameter out of this thing? And I'm gonna say, yeah, let's create a parameter. So it pops up this little thing and I will say country code, is the name of the parameter. Oops, country, it's, since it's a parameter, it doesn't like spaces. Parameter name is called country code. The default value can be US, for example. It's going to be a string, and I can set up an, a description. Enter your country code, uh, for example, FR, right? Okay, so I can just tell him that, country code, and click on save. And now what's going to happen is, right now I'm looking at the whole thing, but we can present it to those users just like this. So they would come in here and they could just replace it for HK or whatever they're looking for, and they would get the results for that particular country code. So pretty straightforward, just a great way to create these templates so that users can now start taking advantage of that stuff. So what would you do next step is you would save it, and then after saving it, you would move it to the admin recommended, and there you go. Uh, maybe you create a folder in your admin recommended of specific queries that you, you want these users to, to go through. Uh, you can do a little bit more on this. Let me just show you while we're at it. I'm gonna manage parameters. You can set values for the parameters themselves. So, um, for example, uh, you could go in here and say, I wanna do text entries. So in this case, it's gonna be FR and US and CH and uh, UK. Uh, AU. All right, I'm gonna just do those for now. Click on save. And the way that it, this looks now is for those users, they're going to have the options as a drop down list in here. Um, by the way, what I didn't show you is that um, those. In, I, in my case, I just chose text entries, but you could have a lookup table, you could do label value pairs. If you wanna put one name, like a, a username email, but in reality it goes and searches for their name, or you can put their name, but in reality it goes search for their email and that kind of stuff in here as well. So pretty straightforward, but incredibly helpful. Let me just run through the lab of actually um, saving this and putting it into, into some organizations. I'm gonna do a save as. I'm gonna save it into, um, uh, what hits hits by country code hits by country for example I'm just going to call it that and I'm going to save it in my own personal folder click on save right oh uh, did I not give it a parameter hold on let me just go put a parameter here because it needed one by default okay there we go so um, again save as call it uh, locations by country, country, <laughs> um, and then I'm going to save this query. And then with that query already saved, it's I can just share it. I can decide to just share it from my folder or probably more interesting for you is go into, go into the administrator area, right? View this as content administrator go into users, in this case, I know that I built it, so I'm gonna go into Mario. I'm gonna find it, there it is, locations by country, and then I'm gonna move that into the admin recommended. And as a matter of fact, I'm gonna put it under get started and click on move. And not only that, but I'm gonna go back to the admin recommended, I'm gonna go, go to get started, and uh, since this folder is already shared, look what happens. Actually, my locations by country already gets shared. And if I look at the settings, I can see who has access to it. And it's everybody in my organization because it inherited the, uh, the values from the admin, from the, uh, from the folder get started itself. So now as a mere mortal, as just a user, I can switch over and you'll see that under get started, I will have that locations by country. So um, any, any of your users would go here, they get under admin recommended, they could see the, um, under, I'm sorry, that's my personal, under, under, under that, you could see locations by country, and they can go in here and just enter the value that they need to and get those results. So 
Long story short, you have a lot of different ways of sharing and recommending content, whether it is searches that you can do search templates as you just saw me see, I do, or you can share dashboards as well that they can run and, 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 and get their data. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely one of the best things that you can do for your users, um, especially as you get ramped up with this kind of stuff. All right. I want to take uh, the last uh, 10 minutes to talk about optimization tools. Some of these you might already be doing, some of these you might not need for a couple of months, but I still want to mention them just so that you get a good sense about this. Uh, let me start with an easy one, which is field extraction rules. I've talked about this in previous webinars, but in short, what field extraction rules do is they allow, allow you to parse your fields ahead of time. Instead of parsing them while you're querying your data, so if I were to go in here and say, um, let's say source category equals um, Apache Labs Apache Access. Let me just grab that Labs Apache. Okay. So if I create this query, I could do something. Oops. Uh, let me not do this. I could do this kind of stuff here, and say I want to parse anything that is before those two hyphens in a bracket, and that's gonna be my IP address, right? Um, and click on submit. So that, in theory, should be parsing my IP address. But that parsing is happening in real time when I'm running the query. Instead of doing that, what you can do is you can build your field extraction rules. If you remember, under, um, under manage data settings, you have this thing called field extraction rules. And if you notice, I'm just gonna open one of these here and just click on edit. I can set up a field extraction rule that says for any data that comes in that's called, that is something Apache Access, Prod Apache Access, Lab Apache Access, Dev Apache Access, I want you to parse the following fields. So it's awesome because then what happens, let me go back to that search. If you notice in here, I run this query and here in my field browser, I already have IP address, I have refer, I have size, I have source IP, status, all those things have already been parsed for me and I can start using them. So benefits for it is better performance. You're not parsing at real time. You get standardized field names. You simplify your searches because now you don't need to put all those parsing in there. Um, you want to build simple but very specific rules and you obviously want to test your rules before you save them, right? You can use the no drop operator, the is empty operator, so you can start testing those corner cases. There is a limitation that will be removed soon and right now there's a, there's a limitation of 50 rules or 200 fields. Um, that should be going away in the very near future, but just keep in mind that that does exist. And then uh, not all operators are supported. There's a few operators that are still not supported in field extraction rules. Um, our documentation has a a list of those few ones, um, just FYI on that. All right, the second one I wanna talk about is partitions. You heard me talk about this before. Essentially, what this is is, instead of getting all your data into one big partition, you can segregate your data into smaller chunks. Let me show you in, the, in my instance. I don't have necessarily good examples of it, but, uh, but that's okay. If you go to, oops, if you go to manage, and you go to settings, you'll have up here something called partitions. And in partitions, you have something called the general index. So the general index is where everything goes. As a matter of fact, look, um, about five gigs of my data goes into my general index because I haven't written proper, uh, proper partitions to send data into the right place. A lot of these are just test ones that I was playing with. But you notice I can say, hey, listen, I want all my artifactory data, meaning anything that says artifactory to be sent to this artifactory index. And I want all my Tomcat data to be sent in here. And I can say, I want all my Apache data to be sent there. Or I could have even said, I want my, um, I want my prod data to be going here and I want my lab data to be going here and so on. So you can partition it by whatever makes sense for you. The point is that by creating these partitions, you're avoiding your data, your data being scanned 100% all the time for every query. There's a couple of best practices. For one is we suggest that there is no overlap. You don't want to send data to source category prod and another one that says source category, source category prod access because in that case that that message that that matches both source categories is going to be sent to both so no overlaps 
The second one is you want to keep it down to less than 20 partitions. Too many partitions and you're kind of shooting yourself on the foot with too much stuff. Um, ideally, you want each partition to have between 1 and 30% of your total volume. If you have one partition that has all, most of the volume, like in my case here, and then, then there's no real benefit to the whole thing, right? And then the key thing is that you want to group data in the way, in the way that how it's normally searched together, right? So if all my devs, if you usually search your, da your data by prod versus dev, then that's a good partition, right? Okay. And lastly, the one that I want to talk about is scheduled views. So when you're running searches and you need to, you need to run searches for long, long term, uh, long term trends, then scheduled views are a great thing. What they allow you to do is think of it as a relational database uh, materialized view. It allows you to pre-aggregate data so that when you run your query, you go against this view and it already has pre-aggregated results. They're great for long-term trends, for finding a needle in the haystack. Um, we notice that we recommend a selectivity of one to 10,000. That's gonna give you the best bang for your buck. And the way that they work is the, these scheduled views are updated about once a minute. Um, they do allow backfilling. So you can build them today, but you can say, look at all my data for the last 30 days, and it's gonna go and aggregate that data. And to, search, to use it, you'll be just using the underscore view equals, and that's how you call the, uh, the, the scheduled view Excel itself. And um, one last thing to keep in mind is that these are scheduled views with aggregate data. So in, in theory, they're not duplicating your data, but they do add a little more to it. So it does count against your ingest volume of data. So I've, I've talked about three different optimization tools. Let me give you a little bit of a chart to, to show you what you would use when, right? So if you're looking to, looking to extract fields, obviously the field extraction is the best way. If you're using your data to identify long-term trends, oops, I keep uh, clicking on the wrong thing, then clearly a schedule view is the best thing uh, for you to be using. If you're looking to segregate data by your metadata, then partitions, segregation is partitions. If you're looking to pre-compute or aggregate data, schedule views. And last but not least, if you're looking to do real role-based access control to deny or grant access, you can use a partition. You can say this person only has access to the dev partition, or you can even say you only get access to the pre-aggregated data, not to the data, uh, to the uh, raw data itself. All right, so I've covered a lot today. Uh, let me give you a brief summary here. Long, term, uh, long story short is that you can bring in any type of logs, whether it's structured or unstructured data, right? Um, there's many different deployment options, and the key thing here is that you have to choose one that best fits your infrastructure. Um, you want to develop a robust naming convention. The sooner you do this, the better, because you're going to be starting to take advantage of that naming convention. Um, you want to start sharing your and recommending content. You saw um, I spent quite a bit of time showing you how to share dashboards, how to share metrics, how to create, uh, uh, how, how to share queries, how to create those uh, search templates. Um, make sure you start recommending and sharing that content. It's going to make it a lot easier for your users to start taking advantage of this. And then lastly is take advantage of optimization tools. So if I were to put the three call to actions, or I will say maybe four call to actions. One is look at your, look at your current setup and think of the different deployment options that make sense for you so you can make it fit. The third one, the second one is ensure you have a good source category naming convention. We just talked about the different options. Let's get one that works for you. And then the third one from the, from the optimization tools, at the very least, make sure you have your, rule, your field extraction rules. Um, those are gonna make it a lot easier for your users to start identifying which fields they care about. And the last one here is any content you create, whether you created or that you installed an app, Share it, share it with your users, recommend that content because if it's, if it's meaningful to you, it's probably meaningful for a lot of your other users as well. So let me pause there for a second. Um, actually, before I pause and open it to questions, what's next? So um, the Sumo UI you probably saw has a, uh, a home tab. I keep losing my mouse. It has a home tab and that home tab has a learn component to it. So 
There's a tutorial here that I would suggest all of you try. It's called Setup Sumo Logic, and it walks you through installing a collector, adding a source, installing an app, trying some simple analytics, um, visualizing some host metrics. So this 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 goes really well with um, uh, with this webinar that you just saw. Not only that, but that tutorial prepares you for this level three Sumo Power Admin certification as well. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't done it, take the level one, level two, and take level three. Um, you'll be surprised that you actually know a lot more than that, that you give yourself credit for. All right. So with that said, um, let me open it up to questions. And I'm going to pause the filming um, now.